Dr. Benny Tate, Senior Pastor of Rock Springs Church in Milner, Georgia. Pastor Benny has led Rock Springs from a church of 80 people to more than 8,000. He served as president of the Congressional Methodist denomination for 10 years and as chaplain for the United States Senate and House of Representatives. Please welcome Benny Tate. Well, thank you so very much. Thank you for being here, Brother Marty. Thank you for this wonderful invite. And uh, hey, thank you for staying. Amen. I, I appreciate you staying. Brother Bailey, what a tremendous, tremendous message. Uh, that was the first time I've heard that message, but I'll hear it again because I plan on sharing it. Amen. Yes. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. But again, it's my joy and delight to be here. And uh, I thank you for being here. And Secure gift has certainly been an asset and a great, great blessing to our church. Now, I'm going to jump right in because I have a person that travels with me, Brother Don Mapp, and he's kind of like my American Express. I don't leave home without him. And uh, he said, Pastor Benny, I've heard you do this message several times, but he said, you're going to have to move. And I said, okay, why am I going to have to move? He said, you've, you've got 30 minutes. And uh, so I said, that's fine. That's good. I can, I can do it. So uh, I want to jump right in to the message. I want to talk to you this afternoon about things leaders do to hinder their organizations. Things leaders do to hinder their organizations. Now, I've been the pastor of Rock Springs Church for 33 years. Somebody said, how do you stay 33 years at one church? When I wanted to leave, I just stayed. <laughs> when the people wanted me to leave, I just stayed. Amen? Amen. I just felt like it'd be easier for them to move their membership than me to move my furniture. So I just stayed. And uh, so I talk about my 33 years at Rock Springs, but what I don't talk a lot about is my first church. The first church I pastored, the reason why I don't talk about it is because under my leadership or the lack of it, that church closed. I don't talk a lot about my second church. I pastored there for three years and I left there for health reasons. Yes, the deacons got sick of me. <laughs> so when I'm talking about things leaders do that hinders the organizations, I didn't read this in some book. I lived it out. I fleshed it out. You say, I'm looking for the example. You're, you're looking at the example right now. I fleshed out everything that I'm going to share with you in the next few minutes that I did to hinder the organization's that I pastored and what I've learned. There are six or seven things I believe leaders can do that will greatly hinder the organization. Number one is uh, this, a foggy vision, a foggy vision. Howard Hendricks said this, he said, if it's misty in the pulpit, it's foggy in the pews. <laughs> if it's misty in the pulpit, it's foggy in the pews. There's a lot of things you can delegate, but there's things you can't delegate. You can't delegate getting a haircut, amen? You gotta go do it. And if you're the leader, you cannot delegate casting the vision. For many years, I made the mistake of letting somebody else's vision become my vision. But what I've learned, God gives vision to the leader. You say, Pastor, where does the vision come from? Well, Habakkuk 2 and 2 says this, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Well, where does the vision come from? Habakkuk 1 and 1 tells us the burden which Habakkuk, the prophet, did see. God gives the burden to the leader. And out of the burden, just as a burden, Brother Marty had a burden to help his local church. And Secure Gift was launched. Because a vision always comes from the burden that God places on the leader. What will hinder your church is a foggy vision. Let me tell you something. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. I added something to it. Where there is no vision, the people look for another perish. Amen? 
Where there is no vision, the people perish. But where there is no vision, the people look for another perish. What will hinder your organization, what will hinder any organization, any church is a foggy vision. So I say to you, state the vision clearly. Cast the vision creatively. Repeat the vision constantly. Paul Youngie Cho said, you'll never be any bigger than your vision. And I have found that vision leaks. That's why you've got to state the vision clearly. You've got to cast the vision creatively. You've got to repeat the vision constantly. You've got to celebrate the vision regularly. You celebrate what you want to see more of. And you've got to embrace the vision personally. Pastor in the same church for 33 years, the greatest leadership principle I've ever learned in 33 years of leadership is simply monkey see, monkey do. You don't teach where you, you don't teach what you don't know and you don't lead where you don't go. What will hinder your church is a foggy vision. Let me tell you what else will hinder your church. It's refusing to change. It's refusing to change. Now, I grew up in the hills of Tennessee, and I stayed with a family by the name of Roscoe and Thelma Coppinger. They lived in a place called Tarleton, Tennessee. A tornado went through Tarleton, Tennessee and did $50,000 worth of improvements. <laughs> Some of you are slow, but you're worth waiting for. But anyway... $50,000 worth of improvements. And when I stayed with Thamel and Roscoe Coppinger, I would say sometimes I am very thirsty. And Thamel Coppinger would say, well, Benny, go over to the bowl. Now, nobody knows what this, I don't think most of you don't, but she would say, go over to the bowl. And I would go over to the bowl and this is a dipper. And I'd go over and I would take that dipper and I'd get me some water to drink. And then I'd put the dipper back into the bowl. Has anybody ever used a dipper other than me? Yeah, there's six of you. Now listen, folks, things have changed. <laughs> things have changed. But I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, it's still water, amen? It's still water. It's the method has changed in how we consume it. You know what's amazing to me? The church is all about change. We uh, talk about when a person comes to know Christ, what a change, amen? Amen. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. <laughs> Behold, all things are pa old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We believe when a person has a blood-bought, heartfelt, sin-killing, life-changing, devil-chasing experience with God, it changes everything. Amen? Now, we, it all begins with change, and we're open to it beginning with change. And, and folks, we're okay with it ending with change. Amen? Did you ever think about how we believe it's going to end with change in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. We believe the trumpet's going to toot and we're going to scoot. Amen? We believe we're not going to take an airplane flight. We're going to take a plane air flight. We believe as Christians we shouldn't be looking for the undertaker, we ought to be looking for the upper taker. We shouldn't be looking for a hole in the ground, we ought to be looking for a hole in the sky. We shouldn't be looking for the antichrist, we ought to be looking for Jesus Christ. We believe one day we're going to stand before our boss, take our loss, eat our supper and come back on our horse. That's what we believe. Come on, I know it's late, but get with me. Now look, it all began with change. It's all going to end with change. But sometimes we have a problem with it changing in the middle. But this is what I've learned. There's no growth without change. <laughs> There's no change without loss. Pastor told me the other day, he said, I changed something in my church and nobody got upset. When you change something in your church and nobody gets upset, you hadn't changed anything. There's no growth without change. There's no change without loss. And there's no loss without pain. This is what I know. If you're leading, you're bleeding. I've been leading a church. Folks, I started out with 25 people. And let me tell you when your church will quit growing. I'll tell you when your organization will quit growing. When you're unwilling to push through the threshold of pain. 
When the pain becomes too great and you're unwilling to push through it, I will promise you your church, your organization will quit growing. What will hinder the growth of any organization? I'll tell you an unclear, a foggy vision, refusing to change. Babe Ruth said it best. (laughs) Yesterday's home run won't win today's game. Yesterday's home run won't win today's game. I've got one daughter, Savannah Abigail. I used to travel and preach a message, 10 surefire steps for raising the healthy, productive, godly children. I'd preach in a place just like this and parents would line up and I'd lay my hands on them. 10 surefire steps for raising the healthy, productive, godly children. Then I had a child. (laughs) And I changed it to three things you might want to try. They may or may not work, amen? You know what I'm talking about. You have teenagers and you understand why animals eat their young. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. I was standing on the platform one night and we had the hymnal. And we were singing, when we all get to heaven. When we all get to heaven. And I looked out there and I saw my daughter. And I said, she wants to go to college. She wants to work with special needs children. She wants to get married. She wants to have me grandchildren. She's now got a master's degree from Vanderbilt and working on her doctorate at the University of Florida in special education. I said, We're, she wants to do all that. And all we can sing about is when we die and go to heaven. And something said to me, you're losing her. I said, I know I'm losing her. And then something said to me, And you're losing thousands of others with her because she refused to change. Let me tell you something, folks. When you're through changing, you're through. What will hinder your organization? A foggy vision refusing to change. Let me me hit number three right quick. Number three, when the leader tries to do it alone. When the leader tries to do it alone, the less you do, the more you accomplish. Hey, this is a financial conference. Uh, raising finances, and it's so important because where there is no vision, people perish, but where there are no resources, the vision perishes. Folks, I, I want to tell you something. Uh, <laughs> I mean, listen, you, you, it, take, it takes resources. If you're going to write the vision, you've got to underwrite the vision, amen? I, I, I read the other day that somebody paid $19 million to have lunch with Warren Buffett. And after having lunch with Warren Buffett, he was asked, what did you learn from the lunch with Warren Buffett? And the man said, I ought to do less. The less you do, the more you accomplish. And the less you do, the more you enable others to accomplish. So what do we do? We discover people. We develop people, and we deploy people. It was a great day in my life, ladies and gentlemen, when I realized I was not an eagle sitting on a hummingbird's nest, but rather I was a hummingbird sitting on an eagle's nest because great preachers don't build great churches. Great churches build great preachers. Why don't we delegate Well, there's some reasons. Number one, we're fear of losing authority. (laughs) I'm the leader, I'm the leader, I'm the leader. No, you're not. If you have to tell them you are, you're not. Fear of losing authority. Fear of the work being done poorly. Fear of the work being done better. An unwillingness to take the time, a fear of depending on others. D.L. Moody said, I'd rather get 10 men to work than do the work of 10 men. The fourth thing that will hinder your church is not understanding the importance of those closest to you. Because those closest to the leader will determine the success of the leader. Those closest to the leader will determine the success of the leader. 
And this is so badly important. Not long ago, I, was, I did a conference, and I was in a green room with T.D. T. Jakes. And T.D. said this to me. He, surra- he said, around every leader, there's a Judas close enough to him to kiss him. Around every leader, there's a Judas close enough to him to kiss him. Not understanding the importance of those closest to you. Um, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say some things that we learn. Here's some things we learn right quickly. Be slow and prayerful before selecting a team member. Be slow and prayerful before selecting a team member. Pastor, this is deep. Where do you get this? Well, I happen to get it from Jesus. <laughs> Yes, I get it from Jesus because in Luke 6, 12, and 13, remember, he stayed up all night praying before he selected his team members. You said, well, but my organization's small, Pastor Benny. You've got 250 people on your payroll, so your organization's large. No, 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 you don't understand. The smaller your organization, the more important the selection of your team members is. Think about it. If you've got 100 employees and you you get a bad one, you've still got 99% productivity. But if you've got two employees and you've got a bad one, you've got 50% default. Be slow and prayerful before selecting a team member. Hire for where you want to go. Hire for where you said, Pastor, I think we've got 100. No, hire for that person who can take you to 500. Number three, hire people different from you. How are people different from you? Who'd you learn this from? Jesus. <laughs> Remember his team? It was a bunch of fishermen. It was a tax collector by the name of Matthew. <laughs> Matthew, who worked for the Roman government. And then there was Simon Zealot, who literally wanted to overthrow the Roman government. Number four, your organization quits growing. When the leader quits growing personally. When the leader quits growing personally. Because an organization doesn't grow around the leader. An organization grows under the leader. Your organization will quit growing when you quit growing personally. It's so important that there's personal growth happens in the life of a leader. Sometimes I'm with leaders and they'll say, I want you to know I've got 30 years of experience and I'll spend a little time with them and they don't. They have one year of experience 30 times, amen? I'm talking about keep growing personally. See, I'm convinced that most leaders are one-dimensional leaders, But if you really really are going to last, you need to be a four-dimensional leader. And what I mean by a four-dimensional leader, dimension number one is inward. I'm talking about inward growth. The most difficult person you'll ever lead is yourself. And it's so easy to neglect inward growth because we assume that nobody can see it. I hear preachers sometimes say, oh, I just love to preach. I just love to preach. Well, let me tell you something. A desire to preach without a desire to pray and study is nothing but a desire to perform. A desire to preach without a desire to pray and study is nothing other than a desire to perform. See, a leader will always stand out in a crowd because they've learned how to be alone without the crowd. I'm talking about inward leadership. I'm talking about your inward leadership. And the word there is discipline. Because whatever begins in your life by desire has to be maintained by discipline. There's a second facet of leadership. That's lateral leadership. How do you lead people when you have no leverage? The word there is serve. If you serve other people, before long, your team members will start saying, I can depend on him. 
I can depend on her. It's lateral leadership. If serving is beneath you, leading is above you. It's serving. The third level of leadership is upward leadership. You remember what the centurion said in Matthew chapter 8? He said, I'm a man of authority, but I'm under authority. He understood you had to lead those that are above you. No matter what your position is, listen closely. No matter what your position is, you're in a dangerous place when nobody can tell you no. You're in a dangerous place when nobody can tell you no. I'm talking about upward leadership. I'm talking about leading those that are above you. And the word here is humility. Humility. I want you to understand something, folks. Somebody says, I want to be a leader. Praise God. I want to be like Jesus. Praise God. I want to remind you of something. Jesus just described himself one time. Jesus never said, I am love. John said he is love. Jesus never said, I am holy. Peter said he was holy. Jesus described him, Pastor Bailey, one time. He said, I am meek and lowly. I am meek and lowly. If we want to be like Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, we won't be into titles. We'll be into towels. We'll be into serving. If we want to be like Jesus. Did you know there were 400 leaders in the Bible? 400 leaders. 80% of them did not finish faithful. Only 20% of the 400 leaders in the Bible finished faithful. The quality that the 20% had that finished faithful was humility. I'm talking about inward leadership. The word is discipline. I'm talking about lateral leadership. The word is servant. I'm talking about upward leadership. The word is humility. I'm talking about downward leadership. And the word is empowerment. Every book primarily that's written is written on downward leadership, and it's the easiest level of leadership. If we can get the other three levels right, I will promise you downward leadership will take care of itself. If you will just discover people, if you'll just develop people, and if you'll just deploy people, downward leadership will take care of itself. Let me tell you the sixth thing that will hinder any organization is when the leader gets priorities out of order. When the leader gets priorities out of order. Pastor Bailey so spoke about this, but our priorities have got to be God. Our priorities got to be our family. Our priorities got to be our church, our ministry. I want you to understand something. No one at home should ever feel like they're competing with somebody at the church. Nobody at home should ever feel like they're competing with somebody at the church. I told my wife the other day, Barbara, of 38 years, I said, Barbara, I'd rather die than be unfaithful to you. She said, don't worry, if you are, you will. Billy Sunday said, I've won the world of God, but I've lost my family. In 2011, I took a notebook and I went to Billy Graham's house and I got down on my knees in Billy Graham's home and I started just asking Billy Graham questions. Billy Graham questions. And I said, Dr. Graham, do you have any regrets? And this is what Dr. Graham said. If I could do it over, Benny, I would speak less and study more. I would spend more time with my family. Every day I was absent from my family is gone forever. Let me tell you the last thing leaders can do to hinder your organization. It's so important. It's when you doubt what God can do through you. When you doubt, ladies and gentlemen, what God can do through you. 
Daniel 11 and 32 says, the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. When you doubt what God can do through you. Not long ago, I had Tommy Barnett was preaching for me. And I said to Tommy Barnett, Brother Tommy, if you could do your ministry over, what would you do different? Oh, he said, Benny, I'd dream bigger. I thought, my goodness, Tommy Barnett. You, you, Tommy, Tommy, you, by the way, today's his birthday. Tommy, you would dream bigger. You started the illustrated sermons. Everywhere there's a dream center, it's because you. You started the living Christmas tree. Tommy, you would dream bigger. He said, oh, Benny, because Ephesians 3.20 says now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I dream bigger. I started out pastoring a church with 25 people. When I first came there, I sold furniture to supplement my income. I sold my living room suit, my bedroom suit, my dining room suit. (laughs) But I read a book. I read a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And I never dreamed when I read that book that in years to come, I would preach many times in that pulpit. But I read a book called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire. And I started praying in our church. I started meeting on Saturday and I'd place my hands on pews and I'd just start praying. I said, God, you know, you did it for other people. Why, why can't you do it for me, God? God, you did it for other people. Why, why can't you do it for me? And and I just started praying and ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. That, That church started growing. Uh, 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 that church started growing and, 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 and I listen, I pastor Rock Springs Church, Milner, Georgia. Our zip code is E-I-E-I-O. <laughs> the June bugs don't show up till August. You got to me too late. It's not location, location, location. I'm in the middle of nowhere. Milner, go to hell and take a left. Milner. And I started praying, and people started coming, praying with me. And finally, they came to me, and they said, Pastor Benny, will you quit moving around when you preach? I said, what do you mean? They said, well, can you quit? I told my wife the other day, I said, honey, I've taken some cold medicine, and it's made me hyper. She said, my goodness, how can you tell? But she said, but they said, can, can, can you quit moving so? I said, why do you want me to quit moving? They said, well, we can't get all the people in the building. And they're on the front porch. And when you move all over the platform, they say they can't see you. And sitting on the front porch, they can't see you. And I go to our board, Brother Marty, and I said, we need to build a new building. And oh, oh we can't do that. I said, we, I, I talk about this in my book, Defy the Odds. If you don't have it, I pray you, pray you get a copy of it. I really do. I, it's the type of book, once you lay it down, it's hard to pick it back up. It's back there. Marty's bought a bunch of copies to give out, haven't you, Marty? (laughs) Thank you, Marty, for doing that. I'm going to leave you in my wheel. (laughs) All right. They said, we can't do that. We just, we we couldn't get the people in the building. Finally, I called a meeting with the leaders, and I said, we've got to do something. I said, we've got two options. They said, what's the options? I said, well, we've got the marquee out out front. I was in the earlier session. The guy was talking about when we used to advertise. Remember, our mode of advertisement was the sign. I had one of those signs. I said, I can go out on the marquee out front and put a message on the marquee. They said, what's the message you're going to put on the marquee? I said, here's the message. Go to hell. We're full. Or we can build. They said, maybe we need to build. (laughs) And we did build. And we walked into that massive sanctuary. That massive sanctuary, Pastor Bailey. 
And my little wife said to me, this is amazing, Benny. She said, "Uh, I wonder how we're going to fill it. I wonder how we're going to pay for it. I said, well, you know, Barbara, if if I write the vision, I've got to underwrite the vision. I believe, Barbara, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. Then I went to that little church. And I got on my knees. And I started praying. And I said, you know, God. I don't know how I am going to pay for it. I said, God, I don't know how. Marty, I said, I don't know how I am going to feel it. And God spoke to my heart and he said, you didn't feel the one you're in. You didn't feel the one you're in. Listen, listen. Listen, don't you ever underestimate, Mike, don't you ever underestimate what God wants to do with your life. Don't you, Pastor, don't you ever underestimate what God wants to do with your ministry. God has a history of taking nobodies. God has a history of taking nobodies and just doing exploits, ladies and gentlemen. Don't you ever underestimate what God wants to do with your life. Never, ever. I'm not some great theologian. But you know, in Old Testament times, the Holy Spirit would come upon people for task and then he would leave. He, he would come up on people for tasks, ladies and gentlemen, and then he would leave, brother. I thought about one day I'm going to get to heaven, and I'm going to say to Noah, Noah, what was it like being in that ark? What was it like being in that ark for over an, a year? I'm going to say, Daniel, what was it like being in that den of lions and God giving those lions locked jaw? I'm going to say to Moses, Mo. What was it like you laying that rod out and the Red Sea parting? I'm going to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What was it like being in that fiery furnace and coming out and your clothes didn't even smell like smoke? Well, you can't even go in the Waffle House and that happened. Amen? And then, Miss Baker, I'm done, folks. I'm done. I'm going to get off the platform. I'm done. I'm done. But I believe I'm going to start walking away. <laughs> and one of them is going to say, Benny. Yes. And Brother Bailey, I believe one of them is going to say to me, What was it like? What do you mean? What was it like? having the Holy Spirit inside of you every day to lead you and guide you and empower you and pray for you and anoint you and use you and bring things to your remembrance. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, if God be for us, who can be against us? You never underestimate what God wants to do with your life. Can we give the Lord praise?